Okay, everybody, thank you guys for waiting. I know you've been uh, hearing me talk about this series for a while, so I pray that this series blesses you guys and that you get something from it worthwhile. My intention up front is to talk about relationships. That's the purpose of this series on dating. So I'm going to pray and get into the message. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, I thank you that we have an opportunity to come together and hear truth. We praise you that you open up the word to us, that you give us truth through your word, that we can trust you because you are faithful. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have done the work to reconcile us back to God, that we might have peace with him. And Holy Spirit, we honor you that you dwell in us and give us light and give us truth and comfort us in times of need and chasten us when we need correction. We pray that all these things are done to the glory of you, Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So if you were my boo, I picked the title because I figured it was catchy, and people know what the boo is. If you don't know, I guess you guys missed the whole Usher and, and, and uh, Alicia Keys song back in the day, If You Were My Boo and all that. Yeah, too young for that. But anyway, there's a big song back in the day. The word boo is now officially put into the, into the human or American lexography as a word meaning my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my significant other. So I wanted to approach this text or this, this series with that intention of if you are my boo. Most of you all are charged in this area. Um, relationships are a big deal today. You go places, you see stores advertising for that, clothing, music, entertainment, schools. You know, we have good, a good board to go ratio. All these things are done to help you, for, quote unquote, find your soulmate, your partner in life. Even at Christian schools, some people say, oh, I need to find me a good wife. Let me go to a Bible college. Right, and vice versa. So all these things are pushed out in front of you. I just want to give you guys a background or a backdrop to better discern these things, but most importantly, understand what is God's will for, for this concept of relationships and dating. So let me see if I can get this to click as usual. Or have a, all right. So while I get this fixed, there we go. So I want to be up front that I'm going to be talking about dating and, of course, Relationships. These are the two biggest issues that concern us as young people today, is dating and then relationships. So today I'm going to actually just focus on relationships. Because to me, uh, relationships is what is, what's, what's, is our target. That's our background. So I want to at least have a nice fixed target before we talk about dating, which is actual arrows we do, the, the pursuing, the, the going about of trying to figure out this concept of relationships. So we're going to first start out with the background of relationships as our foreground. I want to set up two targets for you to at least hone your, your brain on when it comes to relationships. Now, when I talk about relationships, I got to be clear here because we're living in a time where you got to define everything. So defining relationship, I'm literally talking about a male and a female. This is the relationship I'm talking about. So I want to be clear about that up front that this is not to construe anybody, or, or, or you can translate this into other situations. It's simply and purely about a male and female relationship. And what is that supposed to look like when it comes to us, the body of Christ? You know, what does God call for us? What does God have to say about the relationship between a man and a woman? You know, because that should be the framework by which we look at relationships when it comes to you know, couples and all that stuff, and of course dating, which is the leading up to that concept of a relationship. So, that being said, I want to first just up front say that the view of relationships starts early. Every person in here had the first vision of a relationship where? From your parents. Your mother and your father gave you your first instance or first view of a relationship. So me being a parent now, I know that I'm giving my daughters their first view of what a relationship looks like between a man and a woman. My wife, of course, is the woman, I'm the man. But the point here is that that is the vision of relationship given. Now, some of us have better ones and some of us have worse, worse ones. Some of us have poor ones. Like, we don't have a father in the household. We don't have a mother in the household. We're foster children. So either way, the first man and woman you see, sometimes it's you know, mother and father in the household. Sometimes it's not. But that's our first view of relationship. And unfortunately, in a broken world, this gets broken. You know, parents divorce. A spouse might die. You know, you might be grafted into a family through adoption. So sometimes we have to figure out, okay, God, in this jumbled world, broken world, what does a relationship look like? How can I look at a healthy relationship? And to do that, I think we got to go back to the beginning. I'm big on going back to the beginning because I believe there we get an idea of what a beginning 
in the beginning what a relationship looks like. And of course, I mean the beginning of the Bible, not the beginning of your life. So now that we used to have a background of what I'm talking about, which is relationships, and again, against a man and a woman, what does God have to say about this relationship? So looking at Genesis chapter 2, I believe we'll be able to find at least the framework to take a look at what is a relationship mean to God when it comes to a man and a woman. So looking at chapter 2, starting at verse 18 in the Bible, the word of God simply says this. I'm going to look at verses 18 to 25 here. So in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 18 to verse 25 to look at a picture of a relationship. So starting at verse 18, we look, the, the word of God says this. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds in the sky. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever man called each living creature, that was its name. Verse 20, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall asleep, fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. You see here, it said he took one of the man's ribs and he closed up the place for fresh. So we see here, initially, the bond between a man and a woman is a flesh relationship. It's a, it's, it's, it's a bone relationship. It's a, it's a physical relationship between man and a woman. Because God took dirt and created man out of it. And he said, let us make man in our own image. We see this earlier in chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 2. But we find out that the woman is taken from man physically. Now, to give you guys a cool illustration of this, I found this. I thought this was hot. So again, looking at Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, verse 21, we see it says in the word of God, so the Lord God caused man to fall asleep into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and then called, closed up the place for flesh. And we see the focus here is on the ribs. And you're wondering to yourself, like I probably wondered, is how did God do that? Like, what are the ribs like? Now, I'm not a biologist really, but I had to do a little homework on this. I paid attention in the biology class especially anatomy and physiology, a &P. You guys took that, remember that in high school? But in case you forgot, the body consists of 12 ribs in pairs. Now the last two sets of ribs on a human being are called floating ribs. At the bottom, they cover your kidneys in the back, kind of like towards the bottom of your back. Now they're not connected to the front, hence the word floating ribs. Now a side view kind of gives you a better view over here. The blue ribs are the ones that float. So probably God took out one of these ribs because all they do is protect your kidneys in the back but you don't need both of them. And actually, some people who have waistline reductions, they have ribs removed. Now, this is more of a myth than it is a truth because there's not much science behind it, but back in the day, women wore corsets, and if you know those things that you pull, those kind of strings that kind of shrink your waist in, and some of these ribs, the ribs that, the ribs that would give would be these two ribs in the back, or the four ribs, the floating ribs, because they're not attached to anything in the front. But that's how women were able to get these slim waists. And some people who have um, bone disease in their ribs actually get them removed this way. So I'm just giving you a background as to what God physically did. It really did happen. He really did take a rib from man and probably was one of the floating ribs that he put in there as extras to protect the kidneys. But again, they're not necessary, but they're needed, which is a weird concept. But the point is that I want to give you a visual of how we are one, men and women. Man, woman took, man, God took from man a rib, a physical rib. Now, some of you that eat ribs know what they look like, the short ribs, but we have longer limbs than our ribs. So this is physically what God did to us to make us one. So moving on to verse 22. Again, we're still in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 22 says, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And this is the fun, this is a great part. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, real quick, I want you guys to focus here on bone of my bones. This is huge because it implies two things. Bones hold us up. They're our structure. That's what keeps us from falling into a big sack of water, a sack of flesh, is our bones. So our bones hold us up. Those, the bones are fortified by calcium, vitamin D, and a bunch of other things that hold us up. 
And we're saying here that the woman is like our bones. They're, they, they're physically one with us that way. We are both dependent on each other to hold each other up. She's bone of my bone. So, but remember that going forward because we're going to use that. So remember that we are one flesh, but we're also bone of bone. We share that in common. And of course, the part that we like to say is too is flesh of my flesh. Now, I know that there's a big idea there that people grew up with this concept of finding a soulmate. You know, she's the one for me. He was made for me. Now, I don't argue against the concept of God creating somebody for you, but I don't believe using the term soulmate is, is, is fair because it takes away from the fact that our souls without Christ are corrupt. They're dead. So, and technically, we're flesh mates, right? We're, we're bone mates. So we have a physical connection that cannot be broken by man because God creates that if, you call, if, if you're called to marriage. And also got to put out there a second big a sign which says not everybody I believe was made for marriage because marriage is a very big institution and you have to understand your position before you put yourself in the position of a spouse husband or wife because everybody runs to the altar because they want to have sex they want to have children they want to continue their name their parents force them to but until you understand your position in God your marriage will ultimately be destroyed by the fact that you are not balanced you're not grafted into Christ first so your soul has to belong to a God before your bone or flesh belongs to another man or woman. It has to. Otherwise, as a Christian, you will fail. This is why the Bible tells us to not be unevenly yoked. Your spirit has to be in Christ so that when you marry somebody who's also in Christ, now you're soulmates because you're both Christ's soulmates already. It's a big deal, and it gets missed in this conversation. But again, I'm not against somebody being made for you physically, but spiritually, you have to be of Christ. Otherwise, this will fall apart. All right. So moving on in our verses here. Verse 24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Not one soul, one flesh. And verse 25. And Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. And I want you guys to understand this part here. The fourth point part is that when you're in Christ in marriage, there is no shame. Outside of Christ, if you're in a marriage, and this is a tough one to say, but I don't see how you have peace. Because the author of peace is Christ. And if he's not part of that union, then how do you have no shame? We all come into any relationship, even friendships, with baggage. Lies you told, sins you committed, ways you, ways, ways you failed. But until you reconcile yourself to the cross, you can't come to somebody clean and whole and righteous. You come to them broken and broken down, and you will break them down, and they'll break you down. And we'll talk about this more a little bit later. But I just want to give you that picture. So now that I've at least given you an idea of what God has to say about relationships, he says that if we're in a marriage relationship, if we're in a boy, girl, man, woman relationship, ultimately the, vo the, the, the path of that is marriage. If you're to be with the opposite sex in, in some kind of relationship, it's called marriage. But that marriage is through God's own word. He is the one that says here, that a man leaves his mother and father and clings to or cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh, that is God's doing. You can get married by any justice and peace or any church, but God's the one that has to be part of that marriage. He has to be because he's the one that authored it. Now, people want to take it away from God and put it everywhere else, but know this, the blessing of marriage has to be through God. Otherwise, what the heck are we doing? We're just making babies, you know. And again, we want God's blessing. We need God's blessing. And if you've ever been married longer than a week, you will see that quickly. If God is not part of that union, for goodness sake, you're going to have a lot of problems and you can't solve them. So I'm going to focus now on the guys for a little bit in this relationship. Then I'm going to focus on the women at the end because I believe that the women have a bigger part to play in this than the men do. But up front, I'm going to say the relationship's for him. Now, we use Genesis to get our target up to understand what is God's will for marriage or for relationships, which ultimately is marriage. And God links us through flesh in that situation. But let's focus on the guy for a second. To do that, I think we got to turn to the, the, the wise book, or the book of wisdom, or what's called the collection of collections, which is the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, we're going to find a good treatment for men and women. Now, Proverbs talks more about, talks, talks about more than just men and women. It talks about life. And of course, the most important phrase up front it says is, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, wisdom is described as a woman here. And in verse eight, chapter 8, verse 12 of Proverbs, 
God tells us that, that wisdom is a woman and she existed before we existed. In other words, God's defining of the world did not come before his wisdom. His wisdom was created first. And if you don't believe me, take a look at it, Proverbs 8, 22, actually. It says there that wisdom pre-existed us. Wisdom was there before we were there, and God had a purpose for wisdom. And God's purpose for wisdom was to make sure his paths are straight, that his will be done. Every man in here that says to himself, I want to be with God, has to understand that he has to first marry wisdom. He has to first pursue wisdom. Without her and understanding, you will never, ever, ever please God. We know that in John 17, 17, when Jesus is praying to the Father, he says, Father, sanctify them. Give them your truth because your truth is your word. So God's truth, his wisdom, is his word. And men, if you wish to be a husband one day, you have to pursue God's word, his wisdom, his, his, his way, his will. Because in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 through 6, the preamble, it says this. I'm going to just read it real quick because I believe it sets the stage for us, the guys, as to how we should approach any situation. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a discipline, for acquiring a, a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now, men, this is to us. Because this letter is addressed to Solomon and his sons. Well, from Solomon to his sons. Now, the most important part here is that he wants us men to make sure that we are pursuing God's will. That we're fearing him. Now, ladies, as you're watching this and listening to me talk, understand these are the characteristics of a man you should be honestly and continually looking at. Unfortunately, today, we chase our eyes and not God's words. Our eyes are on people and not on God. And if they're not on God, we're going to chase the wrong things. You want the, you know, the captain of the football team, the guy with the six-pack, he's tall, dark, and handsome. And all these things are fine, but they mean nothing unless this part of Proverbs is in that man. Verse 1 through 6 has got to be, or 2 through 6 through 7 actually, has got to be in that man. If he's not of this truth here, then sister, you are pursuing a dead man, spiritually speaking. And you're going to yoke yourself to somebody who will be an anchor in your life. And you'll be sitting there working hard to figure out why you connected yourself to somebody who's not built to last. And that means last God's test of a man, which is he fears him. He honors him. So I'm going to focus here, though. For guys, this is where every man focuses on, when he, or should be focused on, if he's looking for a relationship. Like I said before, the purpose of relationships is what? Marriage. That's it. All this, I'm dating somebody for 10 years stuff and hanging out with, them. what are you doing? You're wasting time to be from, from God's blessing. And next week you're gonna enjoy why I talk about this, cause I'll be talking about dating. I'll be using the songs of Solomon. But, and the Lord helped me with that one. But this is a picture, I'm gonna put up a bunch of pictures in series of what every man needs to focus on when it comes to relationships. It has to be a union of marriage. We don't just get together to be cute with them, we wish to be married to them, these women. That's our goal as men. And there's warning God gives us in Proverbs, and there's blessings God gives us in Proverbs as men when we pursue relationships. But this is a picture we should have in our mind of what we're looking for when we look for a relationship, is a wife. Because it's a blessing, first of all, but most importantly, this is what God, this is what honors God. There's a man married to a woman in holy matrimony, where you go before God and you testify to a crowd of believers that this is the woman whom I wish to labor with until I, until I die. So I gave you a different name. I give interracial couples up here. I give couples from different backgrounds. Actually, in the top left corner, that's Flame, the rapper, and his wife. She's actually Indian. So I'm just giving you guys different views of marriage. And unfortunately, we come into marriage with a bunch of prejudices. 
You know, family wants us to marry this type of race, this type of background, not realizing that holiness does not see skin color, it does not see creed, it does not see anything. And men, if you're judging a woman, judge her by her holiness. Women, if you're looking at a brother, make sure he pursues God. He fears God. We're going to find ourselves being yoked to people because of traditions that are unholy, and they pigeonhole us into a selection of people who are smaller than what God wants us to look at. And you have to be honest about this. And again, search your own heart. It's not about what I think. It's about what you think. And what is informing your view of a husband or a wife? Is it the prejudices of your past, of your clique, of your culture? Or do you look at a woman and say, you know what, God, what have you with this one? I will get into some other stuff here, but I want to just give you guys a vision of God will have a, diver a diversity in his kingdom. And the question is, are you putting mirrors, are you putting limiters on God's diversity? Or do you come up to a woman and say, well, you know what, you're cute, you're holy, you're godly, I love you, I love how you are, but uh, I want somebody taller, somebody shorter, somebody slimmer, somebody thicker, somebody darker, somebody lighter, somebody this, somebody that. And God's like, really? I'm blessing you with one of my daughters. And you're pushing her away because your eyes aren't being met. Or whatever you design or desire, when this woman will fulfill you in ways you will never see or feel or understand. And vice versa, sisters. So be very careful and discerning when you look at people. Holiness has got to be the standard. Otherwise, everything falls away. It has to be priority. Do they fear the Lord? And ladies, this is more for you than us. So, men, we're going to look at two Proverbs, just sections of two Proverbs. We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 5 and Proverbs chapter 6 for the guys. And I'm going to read through them. I'm not going to put them on the slide today. But I'm going to read it from my Bible, NIV, just so we at least are on the same page. And in Proverbs chapter 5, we're going to be looking at um, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 5, 15 through 20. And in verse 15 through 20, we'll see what God has to say to the men when it comes to relationships. So Proverbs chapter 5, starting at verse 15 through 20, the word of God says this. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your foundations be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a, loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? Now, brothers, this says here to us that we have to make sure that, the, that, that, that our source of sustenance in marriage is our wives. Now, unfortunately, today we're fed a lot of information. Walk through any mall, watch any movie, listen to any song. And it tells you about diversity, try before you buy, saw your oats, and the Bible says no. It says you pick the woman, you stay with that woman, you labor with that woman, you love that woman, you honor that woman, you cherish that woman. And it says should the, 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 your, your nutrients, what you get fulfilling from, come from the streets? Or should it flow in the streets? This talks about modesty. Do you come outside with your chest hair around? looking to advertise what your wife is getting say, hey ladies, look what she got. Or do you keep it discreet, gentlemen? Do you make sure that your wife is the only one that's able to look at you and say, mm, mm, mm. I'm so glad that is mine. This is true, brothers. We have to make care, take care that we don't entice other women, but make all women feel inferior. Now, I'm learning since a husband, so this cut through me. You know, I like to wear nice suits. I like to look good, but I gotta make sure that I'm looking good first for my Lord, but my secondly, for my wife. Like, I should receive compliments from her. If other women give me compliments, I should be brushing them off. I shouldn't be like, thank you. I should be like, mm, okay. I should be eager to get them from my wife because she's the one I want to have liking me. And unfortunately, men, as we become stronger, as you become in stature, other women will give you praise. Train your ears to only want to hear from your wife, to receive from her. And when she gives you a compliment, jump at it. Thank her for it. Act like it's the best compliment you ever got. Don't fake it, pray about that. Because this is true, this is what it's talking about. We have to make sure that the women we have in our bed, our wives are the ones that we love, that we covet, that we crave. Otherwise, you see what happens in verse 20. The adulterous woman will come in 
and she will snare you and trap you, and you'll be lost. Now, moving on, our next verse is found in um, Proverbs 6, verse 20 through 35. Now, it's a big section here, so bear with me, but I believe it will bear fruit in our understanding here. So in Proverbs chapter 6, starting at verse 20, the Word of God says this, My son, keep your father's commandments and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them upon your heart. Excuse me. Buy them upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For these commandments are a lamp. This teaching, a light, and the corrections of discipline are the way of life. Keeping you from the immoral woman. From the smooth tongue of the wayward wife. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty, or let her captivate you with her eyes. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread, and the adulteress preys upon your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without the, his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So, this, so is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Verse 30. Men do, not despise a, sorry, men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. But a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Who does, whoever does so destroys himself. Bows and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse to bribe, however great it is. Now, that's a big piece of scripture. And I hope that in that you heard, brothers, that if we allow the adulteress to tempt us, pornography on the internet, movies, walking by Victoria's Secret way too many times. Anything you do that opens the door away from your wife, it is causing you destruction. So the relationship you're seeking right now as young people, before you're even married, is that kind of focus, that kind of just one-mindedness. I would do anything and everything to make sure my eyes are only on my bride. And Jesus is the same way. His eyes are always on his bride. His look to the left, he always makes sure I see you. I care for you. I love you. He reminds you. He chases us. He chastens us. And likewise, brothers, we too must be the same way with our brides. So if you're looking to get into a relationship, this is the ultimate goal. Obviously, making sure that she's of your flesh, of your bone, what you say I do, but then persevering in that, pursuing that, making sure that you do not get caught in the snares and traps of this world. It is very easy, brothers. It is. And it can happen with a Christian sister in the church. You've seen the news, it happens. It's not about some woman on the street with fishnet stockings. It could be a beloved sister in the church. So sisters in here too, mind yourself about men who are married. Be very careful. The way you hug them, the way you say hi to them, how you just dote on them. And it's hard for me because I'm in the pulpit. <laughs> and people want to give me, you know, thank you, Ron, for the payment. But I'm always watchful about my distance physically, but also how long am I talking to them? Are they gazing into my eyes too much? All these things I gotta be careful of, and you hear more about this next week, but the point is, men, we have to be mindful and be diligent to stay on that, on, on, on that tower and watching our fences to make sure nothing is creeping in. Otherwise, it's a wrap. So, hopefully your brothers are blessed with that. Moving on to the ladies now, because I'm well out of time, but hopefully you'll be blessed with this in the next couple of minutes. So, relationships for her. Now, every woman knows Proverbs 31, starting at verse 10. I mean, I think that's like the woman's like anthem, you know, a wife of noble character, right? They hear that, and they beat their hands, they slap their legs, they're like, woohoo, that's me, yes, sister. And I amen you on that, but I also want to make sure you understand that there's also more here than just simply being a woman of noble character. Because the other woman they talk about, unfortunately, it could be you. We gotta guard ourselves, sisters, and make sure that you are also mindful of some of the things you could fall into. When you read words like adulterous wife, that could be you. Or, or the temptress who's a prostitute, that could be you. Now, of course, I don't wish that for anybody, but we have to be careful and mindful of what are we doing to add to that? Are we contributing to that 
that, that lane? Are we giving ourselves over to that? Now, let's take a look at some scripture here, because I'm not going to say and just beat you up with words, but I want God to speak. So what does God say to you, sisters? So, of course, I'm going to get you with the verse that you all wanted to hear, Proverbs 31, verse 10. A woman of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. This means that she's precious. A woman of noble character. So just cherish that woman. Don't just look at that and say, okay, is Ron telling me I shouldn't be that? No, cherish that. Take that in. Let that into your system, into your soul. But I want to also first give you a couple of other places. This is not the first time God says this in the Bible, or in this particular book, actually. This is actually said earlier in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4. It says, a, no, a woman of noble character is her husband's crown. Amen. But a disgraceful woman is like decay in his bones. Did you, did you catch that? It said, in his bones. Where did he say that before? Ron said that earlier. He said to make sure he knows that. Lucky for you, I have slides. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. Remember it said, the man said this, this is now bone of my bones. So hopefully you're seeing the connection here. If you are bone of my bone, and a woman of noble character is like a crown, but a woman who is disgraceful is like decay in his bones. Do you see the connection here? The bone, like, again, I told you before, we become one together in flesh, but in bone, and we hold each other up. So if you are a disgraceful woman, you have decay in the bones. You're the foundation, like women are given the amazing task and burden of leading the household. And unfortunately, or fortunately for me, that's where I sleep, eat, uh, you know, do all my stuff, and your job as wives is to make sure the household is right. If you read Proverbs 31, it talks about her role, but her role in the home. And it goes over and over. So all you women that love Proverbs 31, please read to the end. Because it says a lot more about your character in the home. And that's where it talks about the care of the bones. So be mindful of the fact that when you want to promote this noble woman, that your focus it has to be your household, your family. That's where the bones are built. And that's where this decay can start and corruption. So hopefully I got your attention there. And if you have a Bible, circle it, because the word bones is important here. It implies structure. It implies fortitude. It implies, you know, the temple of the house, the physical edifice. Beams hold up the, the, the household. Bones hold us up as a, as a physical home, as a physical body. So let's look back, though. And I want to give you a little more encouragement before I beat you down some more and just give you a little more, you know, sadness. Because i got to give you the, the, the heart of the soft. you got to get both. So in Proverbs 18, verse 22, it says, He who finds a wife, find, which is good, and he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Brothers, do you see that right there? It says, find. Doesn't say stumble upon. Doesn't say, you know, um, it falls in their lap. You find it. Men, us. It's talking to you, gentlemen. Brothers. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor <coughs> from the Lord. Excuse me. So, brothers, if you're not intentional about seeking a woman of God, not just a woman, but a woman of God, then what are you looking for? Now, again, I will speak about this more next week because dating is a big deal these days, and a lot of families are coming to me about dating to discuss it. So hopefully I do a decent job as we're talking about it. But we have to be intentional about our pursuit of godly women, which means, A, we make sure we keep them godly, <laughs> but B, that we let them know our intentions up front. Don't play games. When you find them, tell them what your purpose is. I'm looking for a wife. I wish to be this, that, and the third. And explain yourself. And if they're feeling the same way and they're in the same space, then you can have discussions. Hopefully your families meet and they discuss. So everybody's involved. So. I actually asked my wife's father for her hand in marriage before I married her. That's old school. And he was shocked. Because he was like, uh, okay, I guess. I'm like, no, we need to talk about this, because this is what I tend to do with your wife, with, with, with your daughter. I believe I was taking over covering from him to me. All women are covered, or should be covered. Probably their dad first, and then their husband second. This is all 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I think it is. We're talking about head covering. But the point is that I believe in that. As a husband, I cover my wife. It doesn't mean I'm better than her. It doesn't mean she comes second to anybody. It's not an order thing. It's a covenant thing. Christ is my head. I'm her cover of my wife. And that's just God's word on it. So moving on, though. Now let's get back to some more serious stuff. So I want to make sure you understand 
they're brothers. When you pick a woman who's not godly, there are some things there. Now, sisters, again, this could be you. But I want to give you guys full counsel on this. So in Proverbs 19, so if you're 18, we're going to 19 real quick. Just verse 13 and 14 says this. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 13, the word of God says, A foolish child is a father's ruin, and a quarrelsome wife is like the constant dripping of a leaky roof. That isn't very flattering, is it, sisters? No, it isn't. But it says here, a quarrelsome wife. This is not a problem for one woman, by the way, brothers and sisters. Neither is you, sisters. Which means that you choose to have battle. It means you choose not to have peace. You choose to go to war in your home. It's talking about the house here. It's not talking about outside the street. It means in the household, sister, you choose to have war with your husband versus peace. Now, I'm going to be blunt about this. We are married to the Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus. We're supposed to be long-suffering with each other, especially if you live with somebody. It's hard to live with people. I've, I've lived alone since college. And then I got married, and all of a sudden I have this person in my house with me. And my wife learned quickly that as much as I talk outside, I'm very silent at home because I do a lot of reading. And I'm very pensive. I do a lot of thinking. So she discovered that the guy in the street isn't the guy at home. I'm a lot different because I do a lot of reading. I do studying. It's just my nature. That's how I get all this information. I do a lot of, I take in stuff. I, I, I appreciate knowledge because it helps me get wiser. Now, I say this to you because women, as you covenant with your husband one day, you will have to give room for him to show himself to you as what he is in, in the house. There should be a difference. Not negatively, but she, he should show you more. My wife sees more of my softer side, more of my personal pains, more of my things because I'm able to open up to her there. Why? Because she doesn't crawl with me. She chooses to entreat me. When I go home, there's a hot meal waiting for me right now. You know, when I go home, there's a day waiting for me to smile. I mean, all these things draw me to the house. And it makes me not want to fight with her, but want to love on her. So you get this, brothers? Like, this is something, and sisters, this is what you should be hopefully working on. But verse 14 says, Houses and wealth are inherited from parents, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I'm going to highlight that. A prudent wife is from the Lord. I'm going to give you another word. A sensible wife is from the Lord. I'm going to say it again. A well-advised wife is from the Lord. Okay, one more. A wise wife is from the Lord. Now, I chose these words because they're all over the, the same proverb, but the point here, brothers, is that this is a gift. If one of these women in here is blessed to be a wife one day and you're in the Lord, this is what you bring to him. This is the characteristics that God will work into you. Why? Because you want to glorify your God. Amen? But also, you bless your husband. The bones don't decay. The marriage stands up. The household is strong. This is why this is said. It's a blessing, brothers. So if you pursue what your eyes see, not what Christ says, and you don't make sure you open up your eyes to see what God has to offer you, if God calls you to this amazing institution of marriage, then you'll miss the boat. And this will not be you. And sisters, this won't be you either because he'll be married to the wrong person, not you. So it, it works both ways, brothers and sisters. We have to be mindful that we fear our Lord and pursue our Lord. That way, this might be a part of our walk. So, Proverbs 23. Now, I have to go to the brothers for a second because it, it, it actually means more to you ladies, but he's talking. This is like Solomon talking to one of his sons. So walk, just, my, just give me a little grace here, ladies, but I'm talking about you, but indirectly. Just check it out. Proverbs 23, verse 26 to 28 says this. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. For an adulterous woman is a deep pit and a wayward wife is a narrow well. That's not good in case you're wondering what that means. But here's a kicker. Verse 28. Like a bandit, she lies in wait and multiplies the unfaithful men, the, the, the unfaithful among men. So brothers, we're talking about a woman here who, who they, they walk the earth. They exist only to break up homes, to cause division, to cause strife. And you have to seek God's wisdom and make sure you listen to your father in heaven. Otherwise, this will be you. And sisters, now I only put this up here to let you know that, again, this isn't from the air. This is from earth. These are women. You all are women. So I'm just making sure you're cautious that you don't do this. Now, you might be saying, but Ron, why would I do that? Why? 
Well, if you walk around in that also tight dress, whoo, and God knows he blessed you with them curves. Them curves meant for your husband. And you walk around here just sashaying all nicely. And your hips are swaying and your shoulders are rolling. You become this woman. Or if you're having a nice little pool party and you're wearing that nice little tankini, you know, the little top that's cute that you saw in that magazine and you bought it, and the, the small crotch bottom, you're that woman. Or if you go places to do things to entice people in ways that are ungodly, you got, again, this is self-examination time. This is not throw away everything or burn it, although some things you might have to throw away and burn them. But the bottom line is this, what is your intention? What is your goal? What is your target? Are you shooting for that God, that man of God? Or for that, 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 that guy who wants to just have ill-gotten gain? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 through 10 talks about him. You have to be mindful, ladies. Otherwise, you become this woman so easily. And you say, well, but, but, but I read my Bible, but I come to church. And it's not talking about what you do outside. It's what's going on inside of you. Are you trying to snare yourself a sexual conquest or a man of God that you can help stand up and make sure the bones don't decay? So I put this up here for you guys just to be mindful of this, but guys, be circumspect. Look around, make sure. Are you also causing women like that to be attracted to you? And you're not telling them no. Uh, I don't play that game. Or do you say, you know what, it's only one time, what's the big deal? And the door opens and nonsense comes in. So be careful. All right, warning. I'm up front, last part is just warnings. Then I'm going to read Proverbs 31 for all you ladies so you can be blessed, and then we'll be done. So warning number one. Again, better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Warning number two. Better to live in the desert, a desert, whew, with a, than with a quarrelsome, nagging wife. And it says the first one a second time in Proverbs 25, 24. Better to live on the corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> Brothers, notice what's underlined. Better to live. Some of y'all should be single. Stop chasing these crazy women. Stop trying to marry the wrong woman. If God has not given you a, God, a woman of God, you can't find her, better to live. Better to, and some of you are like, but, 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 better to live. Now, I don't know what God has in store for you. Some of you are, are on the edge of your seat like, but I want to be married. Then men, pursue God. Fear him. You saw what I read in Proverbs 1 through, through 7. And sisters, if you want a man of God, then make sure you are pursuing that which is holy versus that which is unholy. Otherwise, it is better to live. So, my sisters, let me bless you with the reading of Proverbs 31. Verse 10 through 31, so I can wash you with the word. Because I know at this point you're like, Dagron, that was awesome. You totally like bummed bum me out. So please listen as I close quickly with this, with this hopefully good reading of Proverbs 31, verse 10 through 31. The word of God says this. A wife of noble character, who can find she is worth far more than rubies? Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of his life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while in the still of the dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servants, servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong from her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the 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 the, 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 the distaff, pardon me, the distaff, and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected in the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh on the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. 
Verse 27. She watches over the affairs of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this message has lifted you up. I pray that you have now have the right targets in the background and that you know, sisters, that the bones of the family are in your hands. And brothers, pursue God with fear and trembling. Otherwise, your household will be led astray. And as we close out, relationships. I think all of us need to figure out what it means to be, quote unquote, bone mates or flesh mates, and make sure that our targets are set well in advance to what is holy and righteous and what God has ordained in his word about the relationship that you might be pursuing. And if you're in one, please examine what you're going through. Does it match what God has said here? If it doesn't, you know what to do. Otherwise, everything written in here that is against God's will will be on your plate. Guys, it's death. Women, it's going to be a labor of in vain, of, 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 of in vainness because you will never get the fruit because the man you're yoked to is not a man of God. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for the patience of, of the uh, my brothers and sisters, I pray that they heard the truth. I pray that your words spoke powerfully to them. I pray, Father God, for the few moments we have left that we fellowship in sweet fellowship and we just sing this last song out to you, Lord, and that we praise you for all you've done. We thank you for the truth that you give to us and that we heed it and that the word cuts us, it rebukes us, but, in, but at the end of the day, it makes us holy and righteous that we might do the work of evangelists, of ministers, of those who seek the truth. We ask and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.